Welcome back to Cloud 42, I'm James. Today is the day. With any luck, we'll get the Hemingway sensitive knurling tool assembled and working. At least we'd better because some of the parts need to be knurled and we'll need to use the tool to finish itself. So let's get started and hopefully finished. We still need to make the cylindrical boss that covers the joint where the lever screws into the end of the eccentric cam. And this will come out of the piece of 5 8 free cutting mild steel that was included with the kit. As with many of the parts in this design, there is no material to take off of here to make it pretty. It is going to be the nominal material diameter. So I'll just use some 400 grit emery and some scotch bright to clean up the surface. And that actually turned out okay. There's the tiny little bit of pitting from the rolling process, but I can live with that. As usual, we'll start by facing off the end and then we'll come back with a chamfer tool and put the barest of edge breaks on this, just to keep it from being sharp. Now to start the drilled hole, as usual, I'm gonna start with a 120 degree spotting drill, and I'm starting this very, very gently to make sure that it centers. I'm also touching the side of the drill to feel if it's wobbling at all, and this feels good, seems to be starting straight. Now the drill point for this hole comes very, very close to the end of the part. So we need to drill the depth very precisely. And to that end, I've got a little V block made from a scrap of material here, and I'm going to clamp that on the quill of the tailstock. This gives us a location to register a magnetic dial indicator and very precisely measure the depth. So as the quill goes in and out, we register this on the dial indicator. Now this can rock back and forth a little bit, but it only loses a thou or two, and that's going to be just fine. This is a drilling operation after all. So I'll bring the drill down. I've got a 10 thou shim here, and I'll go ahead and touch that off on the end of the part, lock everything down, and set my dial indicator to negative 10 thou. Touch off, make sure that's accurate, and then we can start drilling and read the depth of the drilled hole to the drill point on the dial indicator. So I'll just push this in gently to get it started, and then we'll drill this all the way to the required depth. Once we've got it drilled, we'll come back with a reamer to ream this to exact size, because we want this to fit precisely on the end of the eccentric cam without any perceptible motion. And I did have to pull the reamer out and put it back in a couple of times because the chips were getting packed in ahead of it. Generally, that's not a good idea. The hole's probably slightly oversized because of that, but it'll be fine for this application. To part this off, I'll just line up the edge of the parting tool with the end of the part using a scale, and then use the DRO to move over to the required length. I am parting this off just a little bit long, so there will be some material to face off, and I am making sure to keep oil in the cut. With a carbide tool like this, sometimes you can cut dry, but sometimes things get hot, swell, and jam up. And when that happens, you will have a bad day. So it's generally a good idea to make sure you're getting the lubricant down into the groove so the chips will flow out without jamming. Now that we're getting close, I'll flip my acid brush around, put it in the hole, and use it to catch the part. You don't want small parts like this to fall into the chip tray because sometimes it takes a while to find them again. Now I'm just going to check the length of this with calipers. I'm going to put it in here. I'm going to touch the tool off on the end and I'm going to face off the material to bring it to dimension. The dimension here isn't super critical. As long as it's within a few thou, it should be fine. And then the drawing specifies a chamfer. So I'll bring the chamfer tool in, touch off, and then feed in the required chamfer width. We might need to bring this back and face a little bit off the drilled end later for proper fitment. But for now, the lathe work on this part is complete. To put the hole in this part over at the mill, we're going to put it on a couple of parallels. And as several people have pointed out to me in the comments, you can hold parallels in place with a spring. This is particularly useful if you use compressed air to blow out the vise because it prevents chips from getting behind or under the parallels. We need to put a reamed 3 16 inch hole one quarter inch from the end of the part. So we'll go ahead and put the part in with the registration face against the fixed jaw and then use an edge finder to locate our zero. Now I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that this hole needs to be a quarter inch from the end of the part, and I'm gonna use a half inch edge finder. So when the tip kicks, I know I am one quarter inch from the fixed jaw, hence one quarter inch from the end of the part, which is exactly where I need the hole. 
Now I'll just come back and use the half function in the DRO to locate the two sides of the part and then drive to the center. Start the hole with a spotting drill and I'm going to start by just touching it and checking with a scale to make sure it looks sane. It looks like I'm drilling in the right place and then I'll come back and go ahead and make the hole. Make a nice spot but try to keep it smaller than the final diameter so there's no chamfer around the hole and then come back one size under 3 16 and drill the hole through into the interior of the part. I'm going to ream this hole to 3 16 of an inch exactly, and by exactly I mean I'd actually like it to be slightly on the large side so that it ends up being a clearance hole for the 3 16 inch handle. To that end, I'm using an ordinary cutting oil to lubricate the reamer while it cuts because I know that with cutting oil, the reamer will cut on size or slightly larger and that will give me a good slip fit on the 3 16 inch handle. And in fact, I have a good slip fit on the 3 16 inch handle. That is all of the machining on this part done. Let's go ahead and check the fit. Got the eccentric cam here, we can slide this in, and when it bottoms in the bore, the hole should align. If I did everything correctly, looks good. Let me grab the handle and let's try screwing it in. And indeed, everything lines up and it looks nice and clean. Leaving the edge of that hole sharp means there will be no shadow line at the joint. That looks good. Let's put this thing together. The first assembly step is to press in the brass bushings. You'll remember that the hole in this arm is slightly oversized and slightly tapered due to a mishap in machining. So I turned the brass bushing slightly oversized to make it a press fit and we'll just press that in with an arbor press. And that fit nice and easy. For the bushings in the side plates, I forgot to turn them oversized, so they're a nice slip fit in the bore. I don't want that, I don't want them to fall out, so we need to do something to retain them. I could use a retaining compound, but I really don't want to mess around with that. I really just want to do something mechanical, so I'll take my center punch and make a single punch mark in the bore. This will raise a burr and prevent the bushing from going in due to the mechanical interference and then we'll just go ahead and push it in. This will scratch up the outside of the bushing, but it will retain it so it won't fall out. Using this technique will deform the bushing slightly. It might be enough if the fit is close enough to cause the shaft to be a tight fit. If that's the case, I'll just go ahead and run the reamer through the bushing again and everything should be good. With the bushings in place, we're now ready to assemble the tool. We'll start with the tailstock side plate and we'll put in the two pins the top one on the bottom with the eccentric cam and the bottom one on the top with this cylindrical bore. The rest of the parts just stack up in order. You do have to put the yoke plate underneath there first and get the pin in place because if you wait until later you can't get it in once the other side plate's on. Got the center spacer there. Remember that's slightly oversized to provide clearance for the arms. And then we can start to assemble the screw. These grub screws retain the screw in the trunnion. We want to run them in until they touch and then back them off a little bit so they don't drag. That should be a good fit. And now we can put on the other arm and fit the screw assembly in. You do have to screw the nut onto the screw before you put the screw in place. Ask me how I know. The other yoke plate just goes on top and there are no fasteners to hold this in. It just gets sandwiched between the side plates and that's enough to keep it from coming out. The other side plate on, we'll just go ahead and put the screws in loosely. Now these screws, like most of them that came in the kit, were way too long. I had to find other screws and in some cases I didn't have them so I just cut them off or ground the screws shorter with a belt grinder. I really don't have any idea if that was an oversight or if I was supposed to trim them to length or what, but all the screws were too long. If you've put one of these together, I'd be very interested in hearing if your screws were too long as well, or if I just completely misunderstood something, but it all fit together. So I don't think I screwed it up. So now that I've run the cam back and forth a couple of times and let everything sort of settle into position, we'll tighten down the screws to hold everything in place. Next up are the neural wheels. It's a little bit awkward because the boss is sticking out, so I'll set it on a box here, slip the neurals in, slip in the pins, and then fit the pin locks. Now this is a really fiddly operation. That 32nd inch wide groove is sort of hard to hit, and the plates tend to move around when you tighten the screws. 
It is a neat little mechanism though, and it looks cool and it works well. It's just a little bit fiddly to install. Put the M3 screws in here, and these M3 screws were also way too long. I had to shorten these as well. I don't know. Those locked down, we've got the knurls in place, and the tool is more or less ready to use. Screw does indeed adjust the opening. Operates pretty smoothly, and the cam does clamp down. It's not a lot, but the depth of the teeth on these knurls is not very deep, so this should be plenty. Tool holder block goes on the back here with two M5 screws, and of course, I had to shorten them because they were too long. I didn't have any of the correct size in my stash, so I just shortened these on the belt grinder. Get those close, and then I'll bias this downward against the screw so that it should be level. It doesn't really matter, but it should be level because it should be level. This closes down pretty narrow. I don't know if I would ever knurl anything that small, but if I want to, I can. Now, with this all together, there is a tiny bit of side play there. Should be about 10 thou because the spacer in the back is about 10 thou wider than the arms. If that ends up being a problem in the long run, I can always mill or grind that down to adjust the fit. But I'm not going to do it now because the last thing I want to do is have this thing be too tight. I'd like to use it first and see how it runs. We have one piece of stock left, and that's to make the cap for the screw and the knob for the arm. And then, of course, the Tommy bar pins the cap on the screw. These parts need to be knurled, but now we have a knurling tool. So let's go over to the lathe and get them made. We'll start with the knob for the end of the eccentric lever handle. Just make sure I have enough material sticking out of the chuck to make it. And start by facing off the end of the stock. Then we'll put a mark on the stock so we know how far down to turn it and start turning this down to diameter. I am not liking the surface finish I'm seeing here. I think maybe the inserts chipped or dull or something. We'll go ahead and index that around after blowing out the pocket to make sure there are no chips caught under the cutter. And yeah, that does look quite a bit better. This knob is a fairly small diameter. I didn't expect it to be that small. Maybe I just have lost perspective because my hands are so big. This is a fairly small tool, and I think it is a pretty good fit. I'll go ahead and spot and drill for the handle to fit into the end of the knob. This drill is one size under 3 16ths of an inch to give us a little bit of material left over to ream it to size. And again, I want this to be a slip fit over the handle, so I'm using cutting oil with the reamer. With that done, we need to taper the underside of the knob. Now, normally I would use the compound on the lathe, but my lathe doesn't have a compound because I've got the solid tool post on here. I could put it back on, but for this small of a taper, we really don't need to. I'll just rotate the multi-fix tool post around to present the tool at about the angle I want on the part. And then we'll just plunge in, take small bites, bring them down tangent, and we'll just form a short taper. Now I can see the hole in the end of the part, so I'm just bringing it down till it has about the right amount of material left, and that's just a judgment call. I'm not really worrying about the dimensions. When the cutter comes down tangent and touches the previous cuts, there's a lot of engagement there, so I am getting a little bit of chatter. I can come back later with a lathe file and clean this up, but I'm going to try to cut it tangent so that's not necessary come back for a finishing pass and just try to bring it exactly flush with the previous cut without driving it in hard enough to cause a problem with the surface finish. And that actually looks pretty good. We'll go ahead and put a little lip here on the edge so that the knurling doesn't start exactly at the end of the taper. And I think that looks good. I don't even think we need to clean that up with a file. I've got the knurling tool mounted in a multi-fix tool holder, so we can put it on the tool post and line it up with the part. I'm just going to roughly try to center the knurls on the part so they'll be on the exact top and bottom. I don't think precisely positioning them here really matters that much. We'll just go ahead and tighten it down against the part and then back it off a little bit so we have some range in the eccentric cam. Make sure we've got plenty of oil on the knurls. 
get the lathe running at what seems like a reasonable speed, and I'll just drop the lever to engage. And we're knurling. Just feed slowly across. I'm just doing this by hand. I think it might make sense to do this with power feed, but I'm not really sure how this is going to behave. This is the first time I've run it. So I'm just running it across by hand. And it looks pretty good. Let's see what we got. That looks like a straight neural. Let me grab some compressed air and get the oil off of it so we can see what we've actually got. And I do see some artifacts in it. I can see where I started and stopped the neural. It's probably going to be best in the future to feed all the way across and then trim away the portion we don't need. And that neural is a little bit fine. I'm pretty sure that is double tracked, but it'll be fine. We'll figure out how to control this thing better in the future. I want some smooth shoulders next to the neural. So I'll just turn a shoulder on the near side and then come in with the parting tool and use it as a grooving tool to cut in a shoulder on the other side, then move over and part off. Before I actually cut the part all the way off, I will come back with a 60 degree threading tool and put some chamfers on here. I want to chamfer on the cylindrical end next to the cut, and then I'm going to try to come in and put a tiny, tiny little chamfer on the edge of the knurled section. This is a little bit fiddly because I want to chamfer on the knurl, but I don't want to gouge the part. I can hear it more than I can see it, and that should be good enough. Now we'll just come back with the parting tool and finish cutting off the part. I am going to want to face the end of this, but at the moment, I don't have a good way to hold it. After cleaning all the oil out of the hole, I went ahead and glued the part onto the end of the handle with Loctite 609. Since it was a slip fit, this stuff should work pretty well. It's had about 30 minutes to set up, and it should be good enough to turn it. I guess we'll find out. The shaft is pretty narrow, so I'll choke up as much as I can, and we'll just take light cuts, and we should be okay as long as the adhesive is set up enough. Start by facing off the end here, and I'm just really scared that I'm going to rip this thing off, so I'm just going to take it nice and easy. Carbide tools can actually generate quite a bit of cutting force, and I do not want to break this free because I don't want to gouge it and have to remake the part. That seems to be holding pretty well. To be sharp though, so I'll come back with a 45 degree chamfer tool and just touch it to break the edge. Don't have a lot of material here and I don't want to dig into the neural, so I'll just be gentle. It's squealing quite a bit, that's probably because I'm cutting too fast. I even slowed down at squealing, it's probably because of the flexibility of the shaft. This isn't a very rigid setup. But that turned out great. The neural is double tracked for sure. It is a little finer than it should be, but that is not the worst result I've gotten while trying to learn to use a new tool. The cap for the screw is just a straightforward piece of turning. So we'll get that face turned down to diameter, polished up and ready to drill. The depth of the drilled hole and the depth of the threads in that hole matter because we need to get the screw in far enough that the Tommy bar will intersect it and pin it into place. Because of that, I'm going to go ahead and hand tap it. I'm using a three tap set. I just started with the plug tap, got it down till it bottomed, and now I'm coming back with a bottoming tap so that I can get within a couple of screw threads of the bottom. And then I'll test fit with the actual screw to make sure it goes all the way down. I've actually ground the last couple of threads off of the screw on the belt grinder so that it will bottom. Go ahead and mark it and then I will measure it to make sure we really are getting all the way to depth. I would hate to cross drill this and find out that I'm just clipping the end of the screw and not actually pinning it in properly. Flip it around, cut it off to length and turn the top of the cap down to a smaller diameter that we can come back and knurl. I'm using a threading tool here turned to the side to try to reach in and cut a groove behind the threaded portion so we don't have to knurl all the way up to the shoulder. Then we'll just chamfer the end 
and we should be ready for the knurling tool. The drawings show the knurl going all the way up to that shoulder, minus the small groove there. Unfortunately, it does not seem to be possible to reach that with this knurling tool. I measured all of the parts, I went back and checked the drawings, and I just do not see a mistake that I've made here. I wonder if there's just an error in the design, that this particular knurling tool just cannot reach past that shoulder, and that oversight has just persisted. You can see if I set the arm on the shoulder and pull it off, it clicks and drops down. And if I try to feed on, the shoulder collides with the edge of the arm. So I don't think this is going to work. I've got to come up with some kind of solution. In the end, the only thing that I have that I can do right now is just turn down the cap. It's going to make it look funny. Aesthetically, it's not as pleasing with a smaller base, but it does make it so that I can reach past that shoulder and I can knurl all the way up to the point where it's supposed to be knurled. So I guess this is what I'm going to go with for now. We'll just do the same thing we did on the cap, though this time I'm going to start from the shoulder and knurl out. Use plenty of oil. Start the lathe. Engage the eccentric cam. And knurl to the right. I don't want to come all the way off the end of the part because I think think it'll gouge it up if I do that, so I'll stop just shy of it, release the eccentric clamp, and see what we've got. And in fact, we got exactly the same neural we got last time, and this one is double-tracked as well. I did play around with this for a while after I finished the video, and it turns out the secret to getting the neural aligned so that it doesn't double-track is to engage slowly. Just very gently apply a little bit of pressure allow the neurals to settle in and align themselves and then clamp it all the way down and you can indeed get some very nice clean neurals you can see some little step artifacts in the straight neural here in this photo and i think that's because i was moving too rapidly i think a finer feed and doing an automatic feed during the knurling operation would help with that i'll keep experimenting with it i only expect it to get better from here a smart person would have done all of that testing before making the parts of the knurling tool, but uh, yeah, that's not how I did it. The last thing we need to do to the screw assembly is to pin the cap onto the screw using the Tommy bar that we made in a previous video. So we just need to drill and ream a hole through both the cap and the screw that should be a press fit for the bar. But since the top end of the cap is a smaller diameter, I'll just use an adjustable parallel in here to support it. We'll get it set up and we'll just use the normal process that you've seen me use over and over again to drill holes in round parts. We'll start out by locating the bottom edge of the cap with the edge finder and then using the half function of the DRO to find the center. And that should allow us to use the DRO to drive to the correct location for the hole. We'll spot it with a 120 degree spotting drill. I'm just starting very, very gently here because this is a small, smooth, round surface and I don't want the drill to be pushed off center. Once we get that spotted, we'll just go ahead and push through with one size under 3 16 of an inch so that we can come back and ream it to size. And I am using cutting oil for the drill. However, I am not going to use cutting oil for the reamer. As we know from previous parts in this same build, if I use cutting oil with the reamer, it will cut just over the nominal size and give me a very nice slip fit. And that's not what I want for this Tommy bar. I want it to be tight. So instead, I'm going to use soluble oil. I just dip this brush in the coolant reservoir over on my CNC machine, and we'll just use the soluble oil to make the reamer cut a little bit undersized. This is a trick that I picked up from Stefan Guttesvinter. He mentioned this a couple of times on his channel. And this is the first time I've had a chance to try it. And you know what? It works. If I'd done this with oil, like I did with that very same reamer in this very same material on some other parts, that bar would have just dropped right through and I would have needed to lock tight it in place. But with the soluble oil, the hole is tight and I'm going to get a, a nice firm press fit. Not too bad, not too tight, not too loose. It's actually pretty nice. I could easily push it back out if I need to. To actually press it in, I will just set it up here on a couple of parallels and I will set up a third parallel between them to control the distance. I'd like this to be nice and centered, so I did the math, and I'm using a little stub of brass that you can't see in the drill chuck to just push this through. And I'll push it down until it contacts that third parallel, 
and then I'll know that it is exactly centered because I did the math and I always do the math correctly. Well, I, I almost always do the math correctly. Um, apparently I didn't do it in this case, checking the sizes marked on this and doing the math again and getting the correct size parallel. We'll just put it back in the other direction and push it back so that it will be centered. And that is much better. That's the screw assembly done. You'll note that I put the nut on the screw before I did this because I don't want to take it apart again. And that's the tool complete. I think it looks great. I really don't mind the mill finish on it. I think it's totally fine for a tool like this and it's going to function great. The screw moves smoothly. The Tommy bar is really nice to handle with the round edges. The knurls are pretty nice. They're a little finer than I would have preferred, but all in all, I think it's great. And the action of the cam with those brass bushings is really nice and smooth. One thing that I did notice is that there's a little bit of looseness in the mechanism. The arms do move a little bit side to side, and that appears to be by design. The spacer block here in the back is actually 510 thou thick, and the arms themselves are half an inch. So there's an extra 10 thou of clearance to provide for free movement in the mechanism. I might come back later and mill or grind that down to tighten that up a little bit. These little locking plates work really well. They're a little fiddly to get in place, but they do work well. One thing that was a little bit odd is that all of the screws that were supplied with the kit were too long. I had to cut them all off or find other screws, both the five millimeter screws on this side, the three millimeter screws in the locks, the six millimeter screws that go through the body. They were all too long and I had to shorten them or find shorter fasteners. There is one other issue in the design, and that is if you open it up to the largest diameter, there is some binding at this shoulder in the side plate. I did come back and I milled that shoulder back an extra 16th of an inch. That provides the clearance necessary. And I have heard from other people who have built this knurling tool that that was a problem for them, that they've complained to Hemingway, but apparently there haven't been any changes. You'll note that the screw is nice and shiny and smooth, unlike the one that I made in the previous video. I was not satisfied with it, and as many of you predicted, I did go back and make a new one. The new one is made from 1144 steel, and I chased the threads on there with a threading die, and I got a much better result, and it is, it is noticeable in the action of the tool. Of course, to use it on the lathe, we'll need to put it in a tool holder. I have the A-size multi-fix system on my lathe, and I think this tool is just about the right size for the A-size multi-fix holder. I think it looks uh, pretty nice proportionally. And in fact, this knurling tool was designed for use on small lathes. That's kind of the whole point of the scissor or clamp type knurling tools. And time. Yeah, I know, it's been kind of a long build, but I've really enjoyed it. It was a new experience for me, building from someone else's drawings instead of designing the tool myself to suit my preferred processes, and if we're being honest, what I thought would be easiest or laziest. But the end result is a tool I can be proud of and one that you will be seeing used on future projects around the shop. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, leave me a comment, and maybe consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download files for all of my projects and get a little sneak peek behind the scenes. Thank you for watching.